Hey everyone, Dave here with another Blu-ray collection update video. In this one we're going to be taking a look at a bunch of newish releases from Imprint Films. There's a couple to take a look at here, so let's get into it. Okay, as I said, we're going to be taking a look at some new title, newish titles from Imprint Films sent over from the good folk over at ViaVision. Now these are titles, I think, from their um, August, July and August, maybe June, July, August waves. I've been... I was overseas for about a month and these were dropping in at home and there's a bunch of movies to take a look at here so I wanted to put the proper time aside to actually go through them all and, and take a look at them all properly before I before I did a video. So a little bit delayed on this one, sorry to the team over at ViaVision but we're going to get into these now. The next wave or the next batch of titles that they're sending over are in the mail as we speak and I'll be getting them very 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 soon. I'll be covering them on, on the next video. Uh, but anyway, let's have a look at... Uh, we'll take a look at this one first. It's in my hand. This is one of their newest box sets right here. This is the Directed by Sydney J. Fury. Uh, who was, I guess, a sort of... Um, uh, I guess indie sort of filmmaker from the 1970s. So you had a lot of filmmakers like this um, in that period doing a lot of sort of politically driven, motivated films that were, you know, focused on kind of slice of life, American stories, stuff like that. Um, I've said in these videos that I'm not really a huge fan of 70s cinema, particularly when it comes to this sort of new wave, I guess, uh, cinema. Not really independent cinema, but kind of new wave is a better is a better term for it. I've never really been a huge fan of the kind of new wave Americana cinema of the 1970s. Um, so this one was interesting to me. This is a filmmaker who I'm not familiar with at all until I got this box set in my hands, but looks like a, a decent bunch of movies in here to take a look at. Uh, of course, this one comes in the nice sturdy hard box that, uh, that Imprint Films always excels with. They're doing so many great box sets at the moment. Of course, comes off at the top there, and you've got all your imprint titles in here, in individual cases, which is awesome. Of course, that's the um, that's the slip that was on the back there that you got the information on the movies and stuff like that. Um, that one was from that one. Uh, this also comes with, I think it's like a sixty-page book. Uh, it's got some writings, some essays on the films, a little uh, a little bit about Fury himself. As a filmmaker, which is uh, pretty good. I always like when they include something like that. It's a really nice little addition. That's one thing that, you know, the, when they first started doing these imprints was the one thing that I said was kind of lacking from the releases. That was like little booklets and stuff. So it's nice to see they they do go to the effort to do that, for the particularly for the big box sets. So let's take a look at these films here. I will say from the top, as I said, not a huge fan of this kind of period of cinema, this kind of style of cinema that emerged in the 1970s. Don't, don't really know why. I think it's just the... A lot of these movies are so political and heavy hitting and they try to say a lot without really doing much. And I find a lot of the movies to be quite boring, quite frankly. So unfortunately, I didn't really have the best time with these movies, but I'm always open to taking a look at some new things and exploring new eras of cinema. And once you start breaking down why is this not something for me, you start to learn a lot, a lot, of, a lot, about, a lot more about not only yourself, but, but the films as well. Uh, so first off, we're going to start with this one. It's called Little Force and Big Halsey. This one stars uh, Robert Redford, of course, and Michael J. Pollard. I was very excited to take a look at this. I'm a huge fan of um, of Robert Redford. Uh, so, of course, it's just your standard kind of imprint Oop, release inside the box there. Uh, this is sort of a motorcycle, Midwestern kind of fable where um, Robert Redford is a... a a professional motorcyclist who gets banned from the racing and he tees up with this younger motorcyclist who wants to make a name for himself and they go off on this like road trip and the trials and tribulations of whatever it's a road trip movie from the 1970s think something like easy rider but nowhere near as good um robert this is like one of robert redford's kind of big flops you don't hear much about it because it's one of his one of his very few movies that did not do very well, and I can see why. It's not a not a great movie. I uh, didn't didn't really enjoy it at all. I found it very very boring. It's only an hour and forty minutes, but it feels very very long. If you're into this kind of cinema, though, I totally get it. I understand the I do understand the appeal, and I think you you you'll find something to enjoy in this. But I just I didn't love it. But Robert Redford is is great as always. I always love Robert Redford. Um, Hit. This one is the next one right here. This one stars Billy D. Williams in the lead role. 
He's like a, uh, a, US, a US agent who is working in, the, I guess, the drug division who decides to bring down this big mob, this big kind of gangster crew who are doing, you know, providing the drugs and all that stuff, this drug syndicate, I guess you'd call it. Um, and he decides after his daughter succumbs to, to, to hard drugs and, and dies, he wants to make this personal vendetta to go out and bring down this drug syndicate. He whips up this kind of ragtag crew of other people who have been affected by drug related things. There's an elderly couple who were agents when they were younger who put, took down, you know, a, a drug syndicate. He pulls together this guy played by um, uh, Richard Pryor. Name escaped me for a second. Um, Richard Pryor in a really fantastic performance. He's not in the movie enough, but a fantastic performance. His, uh, his wife was killed with you know by drugs whatever so he pulls together this ragtag team ragtag team of people who want to make it their personal vengeance to bring down this drug uh, this drug team love this one i actually really really had a good time with this movie i like that kind of it's almost like a, a, a kind of a black exploitation film a soul cinema film where you know you have these really great um hard hitting performances there's a really great message there and they go hard at it really great action and all of that kind of stuff i really enjoyed that billy d pulls in a really great performance in that as well as as i said richard Pryor. i, I thought that was really good that was my i had the most fun with that film out of this box set uh we got this one this is the next one here sheila levine uh, or sheila levine is dead and living in new york city uh this is the story of a of a younger woman living in new york city and it's again trials and tribulations of her and her love life and you know it's one of those movies that you hear it's so you know stereotypical where new york city is a character and you know it's this story of her you know drifting through 1970s new york trying to find her place in the world um and she ends up falling in love with an older guy played by roy scheider uh, who delivers a really good performance they both deliver great performances um in, in this as well um genie berlin plays uh, sheila levine in there um and i thought it was okay again I, I found it a little bit boring it's a sort of a, a comedic satire um but again just not really my kind of thing but i, I thought it was a very uh, it was a kind of interesting movie uh, this one here is the next one, The Boys in Company C. This is a Vietnam War film made in 1978. And um, I guess it's one of the first kind of really um, realistic or kind of Vietnam War films. A lot of the Vietnam films that came out before this uh, were kind of more propaganda movies. They tried to make it look... A lot of really heroic, you know, Americans are out fight for the, for another land fighting the war, whatever. But then in the kind of late 70s, you start getting movies like this where it really put a real kind of pessimistic take on it. Uh, they just I really paint it for what it was was this disastrous war where people just went off and just it was just very horrible, horrible, horrible all wars horrible, but Vietnam War particularly brutal, uh, brutal war. And this is one of the first movies that kind of shone that light um uh, shone that light on 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 that um i thought this was okay this is kind of about this the boys in company see it's a true story these guys that wanted to get out of the vietnam war and the kind of ploys that they pulled together to try and um and get out of get out of the war um the interesting thing about this is this stars and the name of him has escaped me right now and it's not on the back of the cover but uh, it stars the guy from Full Metal Jacket who played the army sergeant. He actually was an army sergeant in real life. And he plays pretty much the same character in this. He plays an army sergeant. And this was, this was pre-Full uh, Metal Jacket. So he was in this and then a few years later did Full Metal Jacket. Pretty much the same character. So it's a kind of weird, interesting kind of thing to, to see. It's definitely worth taking a look at for that. Um, again, a little bit boring. But I did, I, I did enjoy part of that. The Lawyer. By this point, unfortunately, this is maybe a little unprofessional of me, but I didn't end up watching this one because I'd had enough. It was just too much heavy hitting, hard going, 1970s, trudgy movie. So I didn't get around to watching this one, but this one is about Tony Pe uh, Petrocelli, a bright young lawyer practicing in the rich cattle town of Baker, who becomes embroiled in a high profile murder case where a prosperous physician is charged with killing his socialite wife. 
unfortunately i just i didn't i didn't find the time for this one uh i just was not in in the mood for it it stars barry newman who usually puts together a pretty good performance um so i think at some point i will get around to watching this uh but uh, i just i didn't have the mental capacity to to get to that one this time around unfortunately but i did take a look at the other ones and it's a very decent selection of movies if you're into this kind of era of cinema this kind of again the new wave 1970s Sidney J Fury is a is a very good director and he makes this kind of movie very very well it just not for just not you know my um my my particular taste uh but yeah definitely check them out the transfers on all of those look really great as you'd expect from 1970s films very grungy very filmic and uh, they have all cleaned up uh very 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 well so i had absolutely no issues with those there was another uh directed by box set that came out at the same time as this directed by walter j hill uh sorry walter hill um which looked really great some really good movies in there um and i'll hopefully get my hands on that one at some point uh we got another box set right here which was certainly much more up my alley this this is one of the first in their new line of box sets called Film Focus. Uh, these are, I guess, similar to their directed by box sets, but these focus on individual um, actors. Um, and one that came out alongside this um, was uh, Jessica uh, Jessica Lang box set. There's a Marlon Brando one coming out, which I'm really excited about, and hopefully I get my I can get my hands on that. Uh, but yeah, so this is the first one, Jennifer Connelly. Think kind of a very odd kind of actor to put together a little box set for uh, but I, I really like that they've given her the spotlight because she's such a great performer that has never really been given a, a, a great role she's done so many movies but and has had great roles but never big ones she's never been the lead of like a really big movie or anything like that and I feel like you know it, it's nice to put a spotlight on on performers like that who really kind of deserve deserve a little bit of the spotlight uh, so again nice real hard hard box here i like the um the kind of uh silver foil that they've got on the on the logos on the front there really nice little box set so of course comes off like that we've got a little i guess it's another 50 60 ish page book booklet there which is again some essays on the movies some photos and information on jennifer connelly in there too which is really cool um, and we've got three movies in here from sort of varying periods in her career. This first one right here uh, from the early 90s, Career Opportunities. Uh, this is one that I've been wanting to see for a long time because this is written by uh, the late, great John Hughes, who, of course, we all know from all the great teen movies from the 80s, uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Sixteen Candles, Breakfast Club, all of those really great ones, stuff like Vacation and, and Planes, Trains and Automobiles and all of that. Um, and so she's in, in one of the lead roles here alongside Frank Whaley, who did a lot of kind of bit parts in these uh, in these sort of films from, from this period as well. Um, and he's described here as a smooth-talking small-town guy, and he kind of... He finds himself working at the night shift at Target and he's alone there and it ends up getting, um, the, she, Jennifer Connelly plays the daughter of um, the, the town's wealthiest citizen. She winds up at the Target store at night and they both end up getting locked in because they don't have the keys and then the store gets robbed. By, uh, by a pair of robbers. Uh, one of them pa uh, played by, of course, Dermot Mulroney in one of his earliest roles as well. Um, I thought this was fun. Really kind of quirky, sweet, rom-com uh, sort of thing. It's not one of John Hughes's best. It's certainly not one of his best known films either. Uh, it's kind of on the lower, maybe the mid to lower echelon of his films. Uh, but I, I had quite fun time with this. It's a cute little movie and um, the, the uh, uh, the chemistry between uh, between Connolly and Frank Whaley is is really nice. They deliver some really nice performances in that. I'd say it's definitely worth a watch. I, I, had, I had a good time with that one. And the next one here comes from 2000s, so we, so we skip forward about 10 years. This is Waking the Dead. It stars uh, Connolly alongside Billy Crudup, who is a performer who I've uh, found a real liking to, uh, towards lately. Uh, he's done some really, really great stuff, um, particularly most recently, he um, is in uh, the Morning Wars, or as it's called in America, Morning Show on Apple TV. Uh, that really great show, and he he's really good in that show. And I've really liked sort of watching a few of his older performances recently. This one, he plays a, um, a presidential candidate uh, who is, uh, or a congressional candidate. And it's sort of about his kind of rise and kind of fall 
in you know kind of rising to the top of the uh, of the congressional and it's kind of flash flashes back between the 1970s where he had this the love of his life played by Jennifer Connelly and then the 1980s um, and she dies in this horrible car crash but he can never quite let go of her and many years later he kind of falls in with this conspiracy theory that she may still be alive um, and we never really know throughout the movie whether she is alive or whether he's just kind of you know going through mental uh kind of uh, mental things going on um kind of interesting movie i did find it a little bit boring again it's only an hour and 45 minutes but it was it's kind of a very slow movie the editing is kind of um really choppy and it kind of makes it a little bit more confusing to follow and especially the kind of unreliable narrative of the whole thing didn't love it, but uh, I wish I loved it. Uh, I wish I loved it more. But it's a, it's an okay movie. And this one right here comes from 2003, so only a few years later. It's House of Sand and Fog. This is a movie I wanted to see for a long time. I heard nothing but great, great things about this. Of course, Jennifer Connelly, and she's alongside the great Ben Kingsley in here. Um, Jennifer Connelly plays this woman who is evicted from her home and essentially becomes homeless. And this family. Uh, moves into her home or sort of settles in her home it, uh, to, it's a, they purchase the house to kind of uh, become sort of like a, uh, an investment property for him before he then goes on and buys a bigger house for his family and then she starts causing them a little bit of trouble because she still believes it's her house um, and she kind of kind of invades on their life a little bit and things go a bit a bit haywire a little bit crazy Fantastic performances here from both Jennifer Connelly and Ben Kingsley. Two of the best performances I've seen from either of them. And I think, you no, know, you hear over the years that Ben Kingsley was absolutely snubbed for an Oscar for this movie. And I think he certainly, you know, should have been up there because it really great performance. This is like a kind of a horror, thriller, drama... It's just really fantastic, really uh, the a very atmospheric movie as well. One of the earlier films from DreamWorks Pictures too, so you know it's got to be good. They were pumping out some great stuff in the early 2000s. I loved this. I thought this was fantastic. This is my favourite movie out of this whole bunch here. Uh, definitely, definitely worth a lot uh, a watch. And I think this box set's definitely worth picking up because there's some three pretty decent movies in that right there. So, yeah, the Jennifer Connelly box set gets a, a big thumbs up from me. And they're all, you know, fairly contemporary movies too. So the transfers on them uh, are very, very nice. Uh, this next one here is an individual imprint release. I think they did a few kind of individual release over the last few months, but this is the only one that got sent over to me. Uh, this is called Searching for Bobby Fisher, which is um, not something that I really even heard of, uh, but it's uh, kind of an interesting movie from the early 1990s. It's kind of like um, well, you got a lot of sort of inspirational, sort of light-hearted family sort of movies around that period which was uh kind of led by young actors in uh, in sort of like these kind of light-hearted roles uh this stars uh, the name of the kid i'm not too sure the name of the kid um uh, but it's also got joe montagna in there lawrence fishburne ben kingsley again really really great uh roster of, of actors in here and this is just about like a chess prodigy this kid is a chess prodigy and uh it kind of follows his um follows his his path to become a chess champion and he ends up playing all these really great champions of the game i thought it was a good movie light-hearted easy to watch and just a really beautiful message and, and nice to follow follow the kids journey i think that one's definitely worth uh, worth picking up and you know, i'm just a kind of a sucker for a nostalgic 1990s early 90s movie that's kind of my period of movies i love it um we've got this one right here now this isn't an imprint release a bit strange because i feel like this kind of really would have actually fit in with the imprint line really well uh, this one's called four rooms uh this is from the early 90s as well if i can see on the back uh, doesn't, oh, 1995. So this is a movie that came out, again, middle 90s, where kind of entering that era, I need a nice slipcover on that there, which is why I found this kind of odd, because usually the imprint, the standard, uh, sorry, Viavision releases don't come in a slipcover, but they're starting to do that now on, on a lot of these kind of individual releases, which is good, adding a little bit of value uh, for the back there. Actually, I've just realised, if you can, if you can see that, there's, there's a, print on the inside of the slip right there which is uh quite cool 
Uh, this is a movie that, that spawned sort of during the indie ri rise of indie filmmakers in the early 1950s. That became the it thing. Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, all those, you know, fantastically uh, talented filmmakers from the era kind of kicked off this big boom where studios really wanted films from independent filmmakers. And this movie kind of spawned out of discussions between four independent filmmakers. Uh, they are, of course, as I said, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, Alison Anders and uh, uh, Alexandra Rockwell, um, who all came together and said, hey, let's let's work on a movie together. Tarantino devised this idea where all four of them would do their own short films. No one would know what other short film the others were making. The only one who knew was Tarantino. Um, and the others had no idea what was going on, but they all had to use the one character, which uh, is Tim Roth. Tim Roth plays the bellhop at this hotel, and each short story kind of tells this really kind of weird, quirky story about him being drawn into these different hotel rooms, the four rooms, um, and each short is just, has that director's stamp on it, there's a little bit of a, there's a fantastic, with like a fantasy one. There's of course a uh, kind of quirky comedy one from Tarantino. You've got the Rodriguez heavy kind of action stylized film. And they all blend together and it makes for a, just a very strange movie. Not a great movie. The shorts aren't the best. In fact, I think Rodriguez is the, is the best one. And Tim Roth delivers just a really weird wacky performance. It's fun to watch and as someone who loves particularly Tarantino and Rodriguez, I'm a huge fan of their work, finally got a chance to check out kind of the missing link in their filmography for me. Um, and yeah, look, enjoyed it, but it's just not the best movie. Really weird performances. The short films aren't great. They come together okay. Uh, but yeah, it's just one of those weird kind of movies from the 90s that shouldn't have happened, but did. And I'm grateful it did. But it's got a really great cast. Of course, we've also got Antonio Banderas, Jessica Beals, um, uh, uh, Madonna is in there, Marissa Tomei, and Bruce Willis in an uncredited role, I believe because he did the role for free as a, as, a, um, as a favor to his friend Tarantino. And when the Screen Actors Guild found out about it, uh, they were not happy because legally you're not supposed to work for free on a SAG film. Um, and it was either get sued by SAG or go uncredited on the movie. So he went uncredited on the film. Uh, but there you go. Uh, this is the kind of waiver titles there that I got picked up, uh, that, uh, that I was sent over from the wonderful team over at Viavision and Imprint Films. Again, these are all out now. I don't believe any of these have sold out at the moment, but I think the, uh, the Sydney J Fury one is in particular demand. So I'd get on that one as soon as you possibly can. But uh, thanks again to the team over at Viavision Imprint for sending those out. And again, I'll have another wave uh, another handful of these to cover in a few weeks time thanks again for watching see you on the next one